That brings us to the CEO's second duty, building everyone or more accurately, building the senior team. All the executives report to the CEO, so it's the CEO's job to hire, fire, and manage the executive team. From coaching CEOs, I actually think this is the most important skill of all. Because when a CEO hires an excellent senior team, that team can keep the company running. When a CEO hire a poor senior team, the CEO is up spending all of their time trying to do with the team, and not nearly enough time trying to do with other elements of their job. The senior team can and often does develop the strategy for the company, but ultimately it's always the CEO who has the final, go-no-go, -no -go decision on strategy. Doctors know a lot about prescribing medications. Take two brisk walks and call me in the morning. But for many patients, a light get moving plan might be just what the doctor should have ordered. Many of us aren't exactly in peak physical condition, but a large number of people are actually deconditioned. So says the Mayo Clinic's Michael Joyner in an essay in the Journal of Physiology. After surgery, illness, pregnancy or extended inactivity for any reason, people might feel faint or fatigued when they try even mild exercise. These signs, Joyner argues, should be recognized by doctors not as symptoms that should be treated with drugs, but rather as a medical state of deconditioning that might be better helped with a gentle, guided exercise program. It might sound counterintuitive that fatigue can be beat back with exercise, but remember Newton, Isaac, not Fig. A body at rest stays at rest, and a body in motion needs to resist external forces acting upon it that might slow it down. Life in the UK 2012 provides a unique overview of well-being in the UK today. The report is the first snapshot of life in the UK to be delivered by the Measuring National Well-Being Program and will be updated and published annually. Well-being is discussed in terms of the economy, people and the environment. Information such as the unemployment rate or number of crimes against the person are presented alongside data on people's thoughts and feelings, for example, satisfaction with our jobs or leisure time and fear of crime. Together. A richer picture on how society is doing is provided. You might picture Neanderthals as cavemen gnawing on bones around a campfire. Which wouldn't be inaccurate, but Neanderthals may have also dined on roasted vegetables and known a bit about medicinal plants too. So says a study in the journal Nader Wissenschaften, The Science of Nature. Researchers analyzed hardened dental plaque from five Neanderthals found in El Cidron Cave, in northern Spain. Yes, 50,000-year-old dental plaque. And they found a lot lurking between the teeth. Like evidence of nuts, grasses and green veggies chemical traces of wood smoke, and tiny, intact starch granules, proof Neanderthals ate their carbs. And in one individual, they detected compounds found in the medicinal herbs chamomile and yarrow. The herbs have no nutritional value, and since Neanderthals did have the gene to detect the herbs' bitter taste, the researchers speculate that the cave dwellers were munching on them not as food, but to self-medicate. That is ultimately what may happen, but at the very beginning it could be that agriculture was developed because people wanted special status foods for feasting. That it was actually a social need. I mean, how much of what we do in our lives is generated by competition with others? And a lot of that is powered by desire for new things, new statuses, new whatever it might be. Respect, recognition also are important. And in small-scale societies a lot of those sorts of factors are generated by the ability to, for instance, throw feasts. 
One possibility is that some of these foods that were being grown were actually intended especially as feasting foods. Why do we need more entrepreneurs right now? The entrepreneurs who create and run our businesses, who play by the rules, are in fact critical to our success as a nation. We need them especially today. Business, not government, will end this recession. Government must help by creating fair rules, sound monetary policy, and by protecting our fellow citizens in periods when they are jobless. We have to make way for the new entrepreneurial firms that will push us to frontiers of innovation. I would have guessed a Wild West performer was practicing with a bullwhip while also vacuuming. But no. That sound is apparently produced by the Aurora Borealis, the Northern Lights. Since 2000 researchers at Finland's Aalto University have been collecting audio, as part of what's called the Auroral Acoustics Project. Folk tales have long held that the lights also produce odd sounds, but the claims were hard to prove. And some researchers thought that any noises produced by the energetic particles that caused the light show would be far too high in the sky to be heard on the ground. But the latest results indicate that at least some sounds are produced very close to the ground. A setup of three ground-based microphones allowed researchers to estimate that the sounds occur perhaps just 70 meters up. The results were just presented at the International Congress on Sound and Vibration in Vilnius, Lithuania. More information about the sounds of the northern lights could lead to a more complete understanding of the phenomenon so if you see an aurora, keep your ears open. Just like corporations, stars, too, can engage in mergers and acquisitions, a new study has identified a pair of white dwarf stars heading toward a merger. White dwarfs are the hot, super dense remnants of spent stars in a binary system called J0651. Two white dwarfs circle each other very rapidly. The binary pairing completes an orbit in less than 13 minutes, and that already rapid orbital dance is speeding up as the two white dwarfs spiral in on each other. Each year their orbital period shrinks by 0.3 milliseconds. That's actually a pretty dramatic change on astronomical time escals in about a million years. The white dwarfs will get so close that the larger one will start to cannibalize its smaller companion before long. The two stars will likely become one. The study appears in the Astrophysical Journal Letters. The tightly wound white dwarf binary should also be radiating gravitational waves, ripples in the fabric of space and time. But today's gravitational wave detectors are not sensitive enough to detect them. That's okay. Astronomers have another million years before things get really interesting to build an instrument that's up to the task. Scientists are looking for Earth-like planets around other stars, but one way to limit the search can be to figure out where an Earth-like planet cannot exist and eliminate those types of systems. In a new study, astronomers turned their attention to so-called hot Jupiters. These are Jupiter-sized planets that have an orbit of only about three days. The scientists looked at 63 hot Jupiters to see if they could find evidence for any nearby Earth-like planets. They found none, but it could be that the companion planets are too small in size or mass or just aren't detectable with the current techniques. So the researchers then turned to hot Neptunes and warm Jupiters. These are Jupiters with slightly longer orbits. They found only two potentials nearby planets, among 222 hot Neptures. And of the 31 warm Jupiters, five showed evidences of a companion. The findings are in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. The current theory is that hot Jupiters formed and then migrated in towards their stars. The researchers say that the migration might have disrupted the formation of Earth-like planets. Good thing our Jupiter kept its cool.
global warming might seem like a botanical boon. After all, milder temperatures and more carbon dioxide and nitrogen should feed flora. But a 10-year study has found that any initial positive effect on plant growth from climate change may soon disappear. The report is in the journal Nature Climate Change. Researchers transplanted vegetation from four grassland ecosystems to lower, warmer elevations. They also modified the precipitation at the transplant sites, based on altered rainfall estimates. For the first year, the plants did great, producing more biomass and churning out more oxygen for us. But their productivity went down for the rest of the decade. What happened? Warming did speed up the nitrogen cycle, which should have increased nitrogen's availability as plant fertilizer. But a lot of the nitrogen left the soil through runoff or uptake into the atmosphere. In addition, productive native plants began to lose out to species that thrive at higher temperatures, but are less productive than the natives. Warmer temperatures may spur immediate growth, but in the long term, we can't expect plants to like it hot. Squeeze the life out of their prey. But how does a boa know it snuffed out a rat? The snake listens for a heartbeat. When it stops, that's the cue to let go. According to a study in the journal Biology Letters, researchers outfitted rat cadavers with artificial beating hearts. They used dead rats to control for other signs of passing, like muscle spasms. Then they warmed up the rats, set the hearts pumping, and dangled them in front of hungry boas. The snakes attacked, and as long as that rat heart kept thumping, the boas kept tightening their coils and applying bursts of pressure, sometimes for more than 20 minutes. But as soon as scientists killed the heartbeat, the boas loosened up. Even captive-born boas who'd never hunted live prey paid attention to the pulse, suggesting the behavior is innate. And for good reason. The authors say constriction takes a lot of energy. And it can be dangerous, say, if an enemy strikes while the snakes coiled around its quarry but by following the telltale heart, boas can keep the pressure on just long enough. Before a relaxing meal. Every year, about 10 million tons of paper winds up in American landfills and incinerators, which is not only wasteful but adds CO2 to the atmosphere recycling helps. But even that material has to be repulsed and paper sized before you can use it to print out that recipe you lines never make. But what if you could wipe the page clean and use it again? Light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation to the rescue. A new study shows that laser light can erase the toner from a piece of printed paper. The approach appears in the Proceedings of the Royal Society A. Taking a page from the Art Restoration Handbook, scientists sampled a variety of light sources to see if any could be used to strip the ink from laser-printed documents without damaging or discoloring the paper. UV and infrared were too harsh. But a bright green laser applied in for nanosecond pulses vaporizes the print, leaving paper that looks as good as new. Such imprinters will probably run about 30,000 bucks, so they probably will not catch on for home use. But people in the recycling world might find that the green laser fits the bill for making paper that's really green. Lead in time is the amount of time that elapses between a business placing an order with a supplier for more stock or raw materials and the delivery of the goods to the business. Businesses want the lead time to be as short as possible so that they can meet their customer orders and minimize the time between paying for the stock and receiving the feedback from the customer. However, this may not happen due to a number of factors, such as delays in the supplier receiving the order or the breakdown of the supplier's lorries delivering the stock to the business. What was interesting and revealing about younger and middle-aged views on old age was how relative these were to the individual's own age.
those in their teens regarded 40 as old whereas those in their 40s thought 70 or 80 was old. For many, health was seen as a determining factor in deciding who is old, and many young participants commented on how fit and active their grandparents are, while others thought ill health and dependence were an inevitable part of aging. The majority of participants, however, regarded old age as something negative, and many expressed fear of growing old. Good evening ladies and gentlemen. My theme for this session is Convergence Technology Change and Business Practice. This is somewhat dear to my heart, in that I have spent much of the last 15 years involved in various aspects of technology and their impact on business. Across a broad spectrum, from applications of signal processing and manufacture right through to the use of utilization data and diary applications, to improve the time utilization of the sales force. So to decades later, what's changed? It's now widely recognized that just 20% of health outcomes are tied to medical care, whereas up to 70% are tied to healthy behaviors and what's called the social determinants of health, basically. Everything that happens to us for that vast majority of time when we're not in the doctor's office or the hospital. Healthcare executives now routinely remind us that our zip code matters more than our genetic code. And one healthcare publication even recently had the audacity to describe the social determinants of health as the feel-good buzzword of the year. Adidas teamed up with an organization called Parley for the Oceans. Parley goes out and collects plastic waste from the ocean. Adidas uses the plastic waste to make shoes. Shoes made with plastic from the ocean, good for the environment and good for business. Because if you know that rapidly growing consumer segment known as hipsters, and I know you know hipsters, then you know that a hipster faced with the choice between a no-name shoe and an Adidas made with plastic from the ocean will pick the Adidas every day of the week and twice on Sunday, and then walk around like it's no big deal but look for every opportunity to talk about them. Millions of roses get handed out on Valentine's Day, but growing roses has an environmental impact worse than many other crops. Start with climate change. Most roses in the US and Europe are imported from warmer climes. All that flying and trucking adds thousands of metric tons of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Then there's all the water needed to, well, water the flowers and the runoff fouled by copious quantities of pesticides needed to make the roses look perfect. There's also the wildlife and workers poisoned by all that fumigation. Add to that habitat destruction where floral plantations displace native forest and wetlands. Finally, there's the refrigeration needed to keep those blooms fresh. The electricity is often produced by burning fossil fuels, and the refrigerant gases also exacerbate climate change. A more sustainable and, possibly, more romantic approach is to go with flowers certified by outfits like Veriflora, or even better, whatever flowers are in season locally. Of course, that's not much help for those of us in wintry climes. Maybe try writing a poem. One seminal difference in policy remains, the coalition has not matched what is labor's most important innovation promise. That is to bring together responsibilities for innovation, industry, science, and research under one single federal minister. Innovation responsibilities currently lie within the powerful Department of Education and Science, and while there is a separate industry department, it has little influence within cabinet. This has hampered policy development and given Australia's innovation policies a distinct science and research bias. It is the scientists rather than the engineers who call the tune in innovation policy in Canberra, 
so it's no surprise our policies are all about boosting government-funded research and later commercializing their results. We've decided to adopt, just as a loose theme for the course, a biological theme so that you can see the connections between chemistry and biology and the things you might consider doing in the future. We want you to think about the molecules that are relevant to your body, the processes that occur in your body, the chemistry that's going on and how energy plays a role. And we've divided the course into four sections and after each section there will be a midterm. The first one is about matter. 